This episode of Untold Stories is sponsored by Paraswap. You'll hear more about them later on in this episode. What is up, everyone? Good afternoon, good morning, good evening. I am your host, Charlie Shrem, and you are listening and watching another epic episode of Untold Stories, where twice a week we get to dive deep with some of Bitcoin's most influential leaders to truly understand how this movement came to be, where we are right now, where we're going, phase one, phase two, phase three, kind of where everything fits all in and how everything kind of stacks on top of each other. Speaking of stacks, we're very, I'm very honored this Friday afternoon to have Dr. Munib Ali, the co-founder of the Stacks. Dr. Munib, thank you so much for coming on Untold Stories today. Absolutely. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here and, and talk to you, who is a true OG Bitcoiner. Thank you. You've been, well, you've been around the space for a long time. And just to give everyone a little bit of background, Stacks is the leading project that's been bringing smart contracts for, onto Bitcoin for a few years now. You serve as the CEO of Hero. PBC, which is like a public benefits corporation. I really want to understand more about that. Um, you've raised money from, from tons of different companies and, and, and VCs. Uh, Stacks has been uh, was on CNBC's top 100 promising startups to watch. You've been one of the main characters in the book Life After Google. You were technical advisor to one of my favorite shows on HBO, Silicon Valley. And I want to talk to you about like Bitcoin, the early days, Stacks, why? Bitcoin, why would, you know, uh, 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 do we want to be doing things with our Bitcoin or do we want to uh, allow Bitcoin to kind of be what it is and how do we grow that whole ecosystem? But going back to 2016 and you did a TED talk called Don't Be Evil. And when I was watching that TED talk on YouTube and I'll link to it in the show notes, uh, you kind of captured the essence between Web 2 and Web 3. And I was wondering you can if you can kind of Talk about that for a second, because a lot of people still are having trouble, myself included, in like understanding what comes next for the internet as we know it. Yeah, I do think like there's a uh, very fundamental difference between the way the Web two uh, operates. Like it's mostly companies, and you're supposed to kind of like just trust these companies. They have all of your data, and you're playing by their rules, and you're you're kind of like just a user. And very similar to how Bitcoin is different from banks. Right. Bitcoin is code and uh, anyone can run it as a transparent open network. And whereas with fiat money, like your, your governments are kind of like controlling your, uh, your money and your banks are effectively kind of like in control of, of, of your financial assets. Bitcoin is different. Like similarly, I think that the same analogy can be applied to Web 2 versus Web 3, where the Web 3 protocols are open, transparent, and there's computer code. And, and not really owned by companies. We can, we can get into some of the debates, like, you know, how decentralized some of these protocols are, but at the essence of it, like at, at a very high level, I think the difference is between uh, decentralization and centralization. Like Web2 is highly centralized. And in Web3, at least people are trying to build things that are open protocols that, that are decentralized. What is, I mean, what does that world look like? Because Web3, almost everything is a bearer asset. Right, everything we own on our own. Uh, we we'll look at with what's happening with with Russia and Ukraine right now. Um, Bitcoin has become a lifeline for people because money has been weaponized, and you've you've been talking about this for 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 almost a decade, right? Yes. So I think uh, for me, look, so I started in Bitcoin in around 2013 in New York City, uh, and it was days. a very a good old days, right? Yeah. Like there were. It was a small community of, of Bitcoin people and people were doing like all sorts of interesting things and just go to these like bit devs meetups and, you know, I don't know, maybe 15, 20 people would show up and they would show you what are the latest things that they are, have been hacking on. And, and, the, and the thing that attracted me from the beginning, uh, so I have a, I have a uh, training in computer science, uh, mostly in distributed systems where I did research work before kind of like entering crypto. And I was drawn by this peer-to-peer uh, network uh, of, of Bitcoin, like because it's it's like there has been a lot of research done in these areas, like decades ago, but I've I've never seen a uh, breakthrough like Bitcoin, right? Like the the way the Nakamoto consensus works, and you have almost like this global uh, state, like global ledger, 
that uh, is kind of like not controlled by anyone. We never really had that before in peer-to-peer networks. Like if you think about peer-to-peer networks, it's a little bit like groups of people are coming together and they're just like talking to each other in a small group. Bitcoin is global, right? Like anyone, any, anyone can um, self-verify that this information is correct. Anyone can, can actually use it. And you can extend that to beyond the money use cases. So inter- interestingly, when we started, um, you know, some of the early uh, early work that we were doing, we were trying to build like certain applications on top of Bitcoin. People would call us that, hey, they're exploring the non-monetary use cases of Bitcoin. Right? Like that was such a category, like it was such a strange thought that can the infrastructure for Bitcoin be used for things other than other than other than money, right? And and fast yeah. forward like ten years. Those use cases are now actually uh, very clear. If you look at NF- NFTs, if you look at stable coins, if you look at DeFi protocols, like these, these things are now, it's very clear that these applications are very valuable and, and, and are finding a lot of product market fit. We, you know, it's, it's definitely not something that we really thought about for a long time, because like you said, I think the experiment of that is Bitcoin was still and to even now was being you know theorized is permissionless money right and so you go back to those distributed networks and those decentralized networks kind of pre Nakamoto consensus or pre 2009 weren't they all somewhat permissioned right there was still you needed to join these networks to join these ecosystems you needed permission to do so and so even like the theoretical the ideological thought of having a system where anyone can join and leave at will, it's very new and very different. And so to apply that to other things that are not even money is a little bit scary. Yep, absolutely. So I think peer-to-peer networks have been around for for a very long time. Uh, I think the most famous system is probably BitTorrent, where people kind of like just download these files from from other peers. But the the main main difference, uh, Bitcoin basically, uh, at the technical level, there, there are two kind of like breakthroughs. One is this idea of a global state, right? Meaning that the Bitcoin ledger is visible to everybody, right? Whereas these peer-to-peer networks, they cannot maintain a, uh, a global state. Like In real time, basically... right? I got to write that yeah. down. That's like, so it's, yeah. it's basically like, uh, think of that as like, it's, they have patches of information, but nobody really knows what's going on in the network at a global level. Whereas in Bitcoin, everyone knows, you know, what is the state of the ledger? So that's, that's, that's one thing. The second thing is, uh, it's the open membership, like as you were mentioning, that miners can come and go uh, in a completely open and decentralized way. And typically, you couldn't do that with with, with uh, computer networks. Like you would always have like some sort of a defined membership of our network. And then once you have the defined membership, those people can uh, kind of like talk to each other and and try to uh, have consensus. But but for Bitcoin, like it, it has open membership, which was like a breakthrough that anyone can come in, be a member, uh, become a miner, operate the network, and then leave whenever they want to. And the network kind of like keeps, keeps staying alive and, and moving forward. Everyone's looking at Bitcoin nowadays as this like money above traditional fiat money. And it's getting, it's getting uh, a lot of attention. Well, you know what? Bitcoin has always been getting attention globally. It's like, why is now new? Or different. There's nothing new under the sun. There's it's constantly be getting attention for ten years. But the difference is now is that you know I, f- I forgot. There's like a two hundred million dollars or some crazy number has been raised with Bitcoin and crypto uh, in Ukraine. And I kind of go back to that for a second because it is on the world stage. But it's not just that. It's become money that is I guess the word is non prejudicial money where it doesn't matter who you are, or what you are, or where you live. Yeah, exactly. Bitcoin is neutral, right? Like Bitcoin is neutral. Any anyone can use it, and uh, you don't need you don't need anyone's permission. So I think it's a, it's in some ways it's a little bit sad that Bitcoin, the power of Bitcoin, actually shines when there bad is some times. sort of a conflict, like yeah. exactly when there are bad times. So that, that that feels a little bit sad, right? Like especially people who've been in Bitcoin for a while, I they would say, that. "Hey, we've been we've been talking about these things for years and years and years, right?" And then the broader public understands it during bad times like when there's some war there's conflict or there uh, your assets are being seized by banks or you know some local currency collapses 
Uh, and I think that's when people realize like why why Bitcoin is, is important. Uh, but hopefully, I think hopefully not everyone in the world has to personally go through that experience. They can still look at uh, big events and realize that you no, know, this thing this thing is uh, very important and this thing is very different. So tell me, I mean, tell me about Stacks and kind of how it all started. So you're in New York, 2013. The New York 2013 Bitcoin community was the best community. I mean, San Francisco had one community and that's that was about it. Globally, there was huge Berlin, all other, you know, down in, in, in Buenos Aires. Uh, but that New York, that early OG community, like pre-bit license days, it was wonderful. I miss it. Yeah, it was it was amazing. I think I don't think that time can can come back. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so I when when I when I started, uh, I think for, for I don't exactly even remember like how I got interested in the non financial use cases, um, but it was a little bit like I don't know if you remember Namecoin, right? It's like the first uh, yeah. first fork of uh, of Bitcoin. Uh, non financial, yeah. It was it was non financial, right? Like it was it was just domain names. And then uh, Namecoin was doing merge mining with Bitcoin, and uh, me and my my co-founder Ryan Che, we were basically trying to build interesting things on top of Bitcoin, right? So we were like, hey, uh, so we, we we were like playing around with Namecoin as well. And back in the day, like you know, Bitcoin itself, like the software was like a little bit clunky and not easy to use. When you go to a fork of Bitcoin like Namecoin, it's basically like you know dealing with something that is very clunky and very hard to uh, to work with. So our our motivation was effectively like uh, really early ideas of decentralized applications, right? So the first thing that we built was almost like a um, decentralized uh, about me type of application where you get your username uh, and you get a profile that is stored in a decentralized way. And a lot of people actually like came in and registered. What was the name of it? I got a look. Uh, it, was, it, it was called One Name. Oh, I remember uh, one name. Yeah, yes. of course. <laughs> oh, yeah, Ryan Shea. That's how I would put it all together. I love him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah, great. yeah. yeah that's how it all comes exactly. together. So uh, it was It was a very interesting, like, that, that was, like, us trying to build Bitcoin applications ourselves and then hitting, actually, limitations uh, of the underlying protocol. So at one point, the, the, uh, the name registrations happening uh, through the app. I think I still actually, have an account, like a, like a one name. I got to look it up. Yeah, yeah, you can you can find it. So that was actually significant traffic on the Bitcoin network, right? Like you are you're actually every time a name is being registered, you're you're sending uh, uh, multiple Bitcoin transactions, and people are actually paying like very high gas fees to do that. And I think some of the lessons learned from these early applications is what resulted in the the Stacks project, right? So Stacks is effectively um, trying to bring additional functionality. To Bitcoin, like uh, smart contracts, that you should, you should be able to basically have Ethereum-like functionality in the Bitcoin ecosystem without trying to change Bitcoin itself. Right. So that was a pretty big lesson for us in in 2017 that you can't um, expect that you can change the Bitcoin core protocol. You can't be like, hey, let's just introduce smart contracts at the base layer. Like that would just increase a. It will increase the security attack vector by a lot at the Bitcoin protocol. Nobody wants that. And, and B, uh, you know, Bitcoin is valuable because it's it doesn't change, right? So the community and, and the miners, they're just going to re- reject any drastic changes to the Bitcoin-based protocol, which I, which I actually think is a, is, a, is a quality, right? Like you, it is, yeah. um, it's a benefit of Bitcoin that it, it, it doesn't change and it's durable and it's going to stay uh, like a durable, thing in the coming coming decades so you so first of all i'm i'm looking now at, at an email from 2014 where i had made one name.io forward slash c shrem and i emailed yeah. <laughs> you asking if i can change it to charlie shrem and you actually did you, you you helped me change my my one name i got another one so i've got my one name for like eight years now that's pretty awesome the that's second awesome. thing is going to going back to what you said so now that's actually a really good way to kind of get into, you know, what needs to be in a block and what potentially doesn't, right? So, so everything, so whenever you'd create a one name account, you'd, you'd essentially have like a username that you could uh, uh, verify, you can set, you can attach your social media presence to, but you can also send Bitcoin back and forth. But what you're saying is with Stacks, 
And with some things, they don't require them to be on chain immediately in that second. So how did that affect like kind of people are going on, you know, paying for Bitcoin with coffee? You know, it's like I can let that real time transaction happen because no one's going to really like 51 percent attack a non confirmation, you know, a zero confirmation cup of coffee. But that transaction should hit a block within an hour or two. Yeah, so I think it's basically, um, you know, build, building up on what you said. That uh, imagine that uh, imagine the Lightning Network, where you can do like tons of transactions in a Lightning channel, and then just go and settle all of that information on the Bitcoin main chain. Right. So the main chain doesn't need to see all of the traffic; it just needs to see the settlement that uh, happens when you close a channel on the main chain. But Lightning is again, you know, uh, focusing on the payment side of it. So our our interest is uh, general purpose smart contracts, like you know, applications like uh, like if you if you look at smart contract platforms like Ethereum. Sure, I think in the Bitcoin community, like people, um, you know, have reservations uh, for some of these applications. That hey, you know, that aside, from a purely developer or entrepreneur perspective. Like there is a ton of developer activity happening in the Ethereum ecosystem. Like there is a a a lot of startups that are coming in and exploring new ideas. And Bitcoin, because it doesn't have smart contracts at the at the base layer, Bitcoin script is pretty limited, right? By design, that's the benefit of it. Yeah, it's it's the benefit of it, right? And 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 so the the idea is, if you have a very secure base layer, can you have some sort of a separate layer in which you can have fully expressive smart contracts? And can you try to then um, have some sort of a consensus between these two layers so they can uh, almost like work yeah. well with each other, right? So so we don't want to change Bitcoin. If you're interested in Bitcoin just as sound money, you can just go and use Bitcoin. But if you're, you're interested in, let's say, starting a stable coin uh, that uses Bitcoin as a reserve uh, uh, asset behind it, or you want to create Bitcoin NFTs, or, or you want to have a lending protocol where you can, in a trustless way, uh, lend your Bitcoin. Those types of applications can be built through the programming layer, which is which is Stacks. Right. So that Stacks is one way of approaching uh, this this type of functionality. Then there are other uh, projects as well in the Bitcoin ecosystem where you know Liquid or RSK are sort of similar. Right. RSK ha- has a has a merge mine, a separate uh, almost like a side chain where it has more expressive smart contracts, right? So Stacks, Stacks is one approach, but there are other, other approaches as well. Is, uh, does Blockstream's Liquid sidechains use merge mining as well? No. So Liquid is uh, it's like designed a federated as, system. It's a, it's a federated system, right? So you're kind of like trusting the uh, people who are operating that network, and then you send your Bitcoin uh, to a wallet I believe uh, Blockstream has a control of that wallet. Yeah. And then you basically get LBTC, which is liquid BTC that is used as gas on the on the liquid federation. And RSK has a different model where it is a uh, multisig, it's a hardware multisig. So you're kind of like trusting the hardware multisig to send BTC over. And then RBTC is, a, uh, is the gas that is being used on the, on the RSK network. So I, maybe we can kind of get into it a little bit because you can teach me. I have a fundamental flaw that I don't like about merge mining. And, and let's war game this for a second. Essentially, as I understand it, part of Nakamoto consensus that Satoshi had figured out was you're not only with mining, with proof of work, you're not only you have the checkpoint system and you have a global state in real time. But you also uh, uh, prevent, you maintain like a integrity of the system because if even if 51% of Bitcoin miners came and said, we want to change something that ruins the integrity of the system, the whole system collapses and there's no financial incentive to do so. But with merge mining, and this is where my, my expertise kind of start to wane a little bit, what's the incentive for maintaining security on a merged mine chain? where it's like those coins are just kind of given to you as a reward. Yeah. So I think the, so there is the economic question, right? The, the economic question is that, so the idea behind merge mining is a little bit like, you know, 
you as a miner have already calculated a hash for mining Bitcoin. Your main incentive is mining Bitcoin, right? So you've already calculated a hash uh, for mining Bitcoin. Can you reuse this hash on a different chain to also mine that chain as well, right? So, so in some ways, like it, it's interesting that, okay, I've already done the computation. Uh, might as well reuse the computation on a, on a different chain as well. But in reality, uh, everything is driven by economic incentives, right? So if the gas fees on that merge mine chain are not very high, then I am not going to go through the trouble of reusing my hash on that chain and mining that chain. Yes, that's my so, point. So in the end, I think it, it all boils down to economic incentives for miners. So, and for economic incentives, uh, it, there needs to be really healthy activity on that network that is generating gas fees, or maybe there are Coinbase rewards if there's a, if there's a separate token. So if you look at Ethereum, Ethereum miners are mining Ethereum because they want to get the Coinbase rewards, which are the newly minted ETH that, that come out. And then they want to collect the gas fees, but the gas fees on the Ethereum network are very high because there are so many applications and developers on that network. So I think in the end, it, it, it is always a economic incentives game like is for, for the miners to kind of like come in. So merge mining helps, but I don't think it's a perfect solution, right? Because in the end, it depends uh, what economic activity is happening on your merge mine chain and are miners interested enough to come in and, and operate there. Sorry to interrupt your regularly scheduled programming, but I wanted to tell you guys that if you're using PancakeSwap, Uniswap, DYDX, SushiSwap, you're doing it wrong. You need to be using PowerSwap because PowerSwap is a user interface, a decentralized smart contract platform that sits on top of all of these. And when you go to PowerSwap or untoldstories.link forward slash PowerSwap, because they're refunding your gas, if you go there, then you'll be able to, on top of Ethereum, Binance Smart Chain, and Polygon, look for the best prices for your tokens and swap and do everything in one predefined transaction on chain, instead of having to do the approval to this token, to that token, to do all these different things, Paraswap does it all for you. It's decentralized. They just released their API version five that you can see everything. It's all open source. Very cool stuff. Untoldstories.link forward slash Paraswap. If you're using any of the other decentralized protocols, you're doing it wrong because you need to be using the routing, beautiful Paraswap routing system, and it's fully decentralized too. It's gorgeous. I'll talk to you guys soon. The the hybrid solution really, you have stacks, uh, and then you it hasn't really been figured out. So like, going back to the days of of like 2016 with Ethereum, everything was proof of work, and then which is, uh, which is essentially mining, and then you have proof of stake, which was conceptualized, and Ethereum is still on proof of work, but. A lot of other, uh, uh, pro like almost every other project that you see on coin market cap nowadays has adopted this proof of stake or some like hybrid of such, right? And that that is a little bit different because it relies on the security, relies on the current stakeholders. You lock up your tokens or your coins, and therefore you can participate in consensus and security, et cetera, et cetera. You've kind of uh, invented this proof of transfer. POX, which I'd love to understand more. But before we get into that, I always thought, and I actually agree with Vitalik when he wrote a paper recently about bridges, right? Is that I always thought you'd have these like multiple ecosystems. Up until very recently, I thought you'd have all these multiple ecosystems, proof of work, proof of stake, uh, delegated proof of stake, proof of, of, of transfer. I mean, you have hundreds of them thousands of different type of consensus algorithms. Most of them don't even work. They're not economically sound. But I thought that you'd have these like bridges or swap systems. But it seems like these are our, these are our broken points. This is where the hacks are happening. You saw wormhole finance got hacked a few weeks ago for hundreds of millions of dollars that allowed people to bridge between different... Do, is it just that we don't... We're, we're, we're sacrificing decentralization? Is the technology not there yet? Will we ever have the ability to like blockchain hop in a very decentralized way. Like, what's your view on this? Because I'm not asking, honestly, I don't know the answer and I'm, I'm genuinely curious. I'm trying to figure this out on my own. Yeah, I think, I think there's, a, there's a lot to unpack there. Uh, so I agree that um, at least for now, we are heading towards a multi-chain world. 
to even even like a year and a half ago, if somebody would say that you know some of the smart contract traffic will actually move to other chains, the Ethereum maximalist would basically be like never going to happen. Like Ethereum yeah. has won, right? And now now everyone agrees because you know with the rise of Solana, Avalanche, a bunch of these smart contract systems, it's pretty clear that a lot of the users and the developers and even assets and capital have moved to other chains. So at least right now, it's pretty clear that we are heading toward a, a multi-chain world. I do think even today, the uh, Bitcoin ecosystem is still underappreciated. I think the being able to just uh, have the same type of applications that you're seeing on if, you know, Avalon, Solana, and other places, having them here uh, in, in Bitcoin could, could, could be super interesting. So I think, I think uh, even... Even today, uh, I think the Bitcoin side is really underappreciated because all these applications can also happen just in the Bitcoin ecosystem. And I think that's the thesis that uh, we are proving out, especially with the launch of the Stacks mainnet last year. Over the last one year, we've seen like a ton of traction, both in like Bitcoin NFTs, uh, liquidity protocols, stable coins. Developers have been able to build like all these things just kind of like in the, in the, in the broader Bitcoin ecosystem. And, and I do think like these things are going to get interconnected with each other with bridges. But the key thing to understand about bridges, like, you know, minus the potential bugs that can happen with, with the bridges is whenever you bridge to a different L1, you're dependent on the security of that L1. Yes. So that's the key point that, you know, if you, if you take an asset that was originally issued on Ethereum and now you have bridged it over, over to something else, now, now you're basically on that something else like the fact that it was issued on ethereum is not gonna is not gonna help you so i mean like what's the future and how do we kind of uh how do all these things work with each other we're talking about well and maybe there isn't really a need for it because going back to bitcoin being under the most underappreciated market you have you have a half a trillion dollars or so in value that can be utilized for something else. You're talking about lending, smart contracts, uh, uh, all these different types of applications where Bitcoin could be the backbone of it. You're talking about the ability to have um, NFTs with Bitcoin built into them. Uh, you could have, like you said, stable coins, like actual stable coins that follow price indexes on top of Bitcoin, the most sound money in the history of the world. Will Will things like that kind of always stay siloed and is that a bad thing i guess or we'll have these yeah. bridges but they'll say hey when you're bridging from one to the other this is the risk that you're taking yeah so i, I do think that um my thesis is that we will see a lot more of that activity in the bitcoin ecosystem and obviously we this is what we do like this is the work that we do and we're seeing the changes happen already right like the stable coins uh nfts and all these things are coming to the to the bitcoin ecosystem but even even if you if you look at projects like Terra, for example, they just recently raised a billion dollar Bitcoin reserve, right? And Terra Protocol is going to have a BTC reserve, which actually I think makes a makes a ton of sense for them to do. Yeah. But imagine if this was built on Bitcoin, then instead of like them going out and raising a almost like a fund manually, you could open this up to all Bitcoiners. That anyone who wants to send their BTC into a stable coin reserve can uh, can send that that Bitcoin and maybe there's some sort of incentive there, right? Like they can they can earn a yield or mint a stable coin. So imagine if you're a Bitcoiner and you don't want to sell your Bitcoin, you just want to lock up your Bitcoin to draw a stable coin against it, right? Because you are let's say you're looking for some liquidity, but you don't want to actually sell your Bitcoin. These types of applications should be possible within the Bitcoin ecosystem, but without the need to actually, you know, go to a wrapped uh, BTC asset on Ethereum and then trying to use that on Ethereum, for example, which You're, introduces. So, so, so the total Bitcoin market cap is like a trillion dollars. And what we need is, is Bitcoin to be like a multi, multi trillion dollar ecosystem. And if that were to happen, if, and, and, and you have multiple different nation state currencies that are reserve bitcoin reserve back because bitcoin is that ultimate bear asset is that ultimate sound money that everyone in the in the world in a in a permissionless way 
can participate in the supply, in the demand of it. And that's the key. Because it's everyone can participate in the supply and the demand of it. It becomes almost like, I hate to say it, like the people's kind of currency. Are we could, could we ever see a point where like there is no price to Bitcoin? Because there's so few of them yeah. that you could participate in these like stable coins that offer you a yield and it almost won't matter what the price is. Yeah, no, exactly. Right. So that's like a Bitcoin standard. When, when, when you, when people talk about kind of like a future price of Bitcoin uh, right now, the most simple story to tell is that, look, Bitcoin is like digital gold. Uh, It's, it's sitting at a trillion dollar market cap. Gold is like 10 trillion, 11 trillion. And it's easy for people to see that, Hey, Bitcoin would be more valuable than gold. Right? It's a very simple narrative and it makes sense. It's working. That's great. I think, I think that's just the beginning, right? Because you can't program gold, but you can program Bitcoin. You can actually use it in other types of applications, like very simple applications, as, as we mentioned over here, like a Terra, like USDT stablecoin, where Bitcoin is the reserve and you're issuing a, some sort of a different currency against it. So nation states can have their local currencies if they want uh, on a, for, to use things like on a day-to-day basis. But Bitcoin is that precious, almost like base layer asset like that gets used everywhere. You can have different types of uh, like derivative products on top of Bitcoin, right? Like we, we haven't seen anything yet in terms of derivative products and those things trading against Bitcoin, like having entire financial infrastructure that is built uh, literally on top of Bitcoin, right? Like if you think of Bitcoin as as the TCP IP layer uh, on on the internet. Like imagine like how many different things developers were able to do on top of TCP IP and they built like different businesses, different websites, different types of services on top of it. How long did it take for that to happen? I I, I think uh, if you look at all the developer activity that is happening outside of Bitcoin, like that is the first signal. Right, that look, developers are interested in building such things, which is which is a which is a great sign, right? And that's why I think it's really important to have the right developer tools and programming languages in the Bitcoin ecosystem. That's why you know we we spend our days and nights working on the Clarity programming language because anything you can build on Ethereum using Solidity, you could build. Uh, in the Bitcoin ecosystem now using Clarity. And, and obviously we couldn't change Bitcoin, right? Like we couldn't say, hey, uh, let's just modify Bitcoin and instead of Bitcoin script, start using Clarity at the Bitcoin base level. That would just never work, right? It had to be a separate system uh, where it's more experimental and it's a smart contract uh, a layer that people can use to interact with Bitcoin. So here are some of the cool things you can do today. Uh, for example, you could send a Bitcoin transaction to swap into another asset, right? So imagine most most people who own Bitcoin, let's say you hold your Bitcoin on Electrum. There are basically two things you can do with your Bitcoin. A, do nothing, just huddle, right? B, you send a transfer. That's it. There are two operations you can can really do. Now imagine that your Bitcoin wallet can, uh, you could purchase a NFT straight from your Bitcoin wallet. You send a Bitcoin transaction, which is a swap into a, uh, Bitcoin NFT, and now you own a Bitcoin NFT on your Bitcoin wallet, right? That functionality is like possible today, like at a very early stage, but through the work that we've done, that's possible today. What's the relationship there between the Stacks blockchain and, and Bitcoin? Yeah. So the way this works is that uh, the Stacks programming layer effectively has full visibility into Bitcoin, right? So every smart contract on Stacks uh, can respond to Bitcoin transactions. So if you send a Bitcoin transaction, it can be input into a smart contract that is executing on Stacks. That's the first thing. The second thing is that all of the transactions on Stacks, they are getting settled on Bitcoin as hashes. So let's say there were like a thousand transactions on Stacks. Every Bitcoin block, those transactions are getting settled as a hash on the Bitcoin chain, right? So that's not to say that Stacks is as secure as Bitcoin. No, that's not the case, but it benefits from the security of Bitcoin uh, in, 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 in different ways. So uh, let's take a concrete example that let's say you defined a NFT on the Stacks layer. The hash of that NFT is going to end up on Bitcoin, right? So you can prove that if you look at this hash on Bitcoin, 
I am the owner of the NFT. And you don't want to put too much data in the Bitcoin blockchain anyway, right? Like you shouldn't be writing too much information to the Bitcoin blockchain because you want to keep the base layer very, very simple. We do. And that's like such a, why is that so important for decentralization? I mean, that goes back to 2016 during the, the block size wars was keeping the, the size of the blockchain kind of nimble uh, is so important coming from a computer science background, like why people make fun of Ethereum and some of these other blockchains that it just takes weeks, endless weeks to like sync up. And it, with that, and then you saw the other day that uh, there was a company that basically powers the backbone of MetaMask and the way uh, RPC, the way all the, the, the Ethereum nodes talk to each other. I think it's like Inferno or something. They blocked Venezuelan IP addresses, which which to me creates like a, a choke point, right? Yeah. So I think it's effectively a decentralization question, right? So whenever someone says that, uh, hey, I can I can give you faster faster blocks, or I can give you kind of like more data in the blockchain, they're effectively it's a decentralization trade off because what's mm. going to happen is that you as a normal user, so Bitcoin always wants to be. Uh, on the decentralization side of things, that a normal user with a normal internet connection on a laptop can actually run a full node and can independently verify the state of, of the chain, right? If you now start increasing that amount of data that needs to be stored, A, like at some point, like you won't be able to do that on normal laptops, right? B, so a lot of these really fast chains um, on the extreme end, let's you take a project like Definity, for example, you literally have to own data centers to be a miner, right? Because the node requirements are so high that you have to own data centers and you need data center like bandwidth connections as well. Not that you're sitting at a, 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 at a cafe and, and you're able to kind of like download blocks and, and process them, right? Like you, you, you need to have a data center like really high bandwidth. So it's yeah, a decentralization question because, and Bitcoin wants to be more decentralized. That's why, when the block size debates were happening, a lot of people were effectively saying that, no, we don't want to increase these limits because in the end, it's a decentralization question. You want to be as decentralized as possible. Well, you have like tribalists and you have different people who don't want to see DeFi on Bitcoin. They think it's like DeFi, NFTs, tokens are kind of stupid and that we should really focus on on the one thing. And, you know, it gets kind of, kind of convoluted into it. Uh, what type of projects would you like to see built on top of stacks? Like what, uh, uh, what are we missing here? Yeah, I think for me, uh, I approach it a little bit differently. Like my approach yeah, is too. that we want to get as many developers to come in and experiment with things that they want to build, right? And you can't really, you can't really dictate that, right? Like people are going to build what they're interested in building, right? And, and Bitcoin is open and Bitcoin is, 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 means freedom, which means that anyone can, just like anyone, you can't stop a user from using Bitcoin. Similarly, you can't stop a developer from building something with Bitcoin because Bitcoin is fundamentally open and, and free and anyone can come in and, and do whatever they want. But I, I think what we need to realize is that especially since 2017, the developer activity in Bitcoin, relatively speaking, has been shrinking compared to the other ecosystems out there, which is something that I think we as Bitcoiners absolutely need to change because I think it's very important for, to have a healthy ecosystem of developers who are coming in, So, which is very different from Bitcoin core developers. You just need yeah. a few, few really intelligent people who can maintain the core protocol. That's fine. But I'm talking about people who are using Bitcoin, who are doing interesting things with Bitcoin on, on, on top of Bitcoin. What's what's proof of transfer and you know this consensus algorithm and 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 why create a new scripting language called Clarity? What what do you think is like a fundamental issue with Solidity, which is the kind of the de facto programming language for all blockchains, even if some other blockchains have called it different things? It's it's typically based on this like Solidity that was invented seven eight years ago. Yeah. So in terms of proof of transfer, I think um, I just personally have reservations against proof of stake type protocols. Uh, and there, there, there are various things, like one of them is uh, it has this bootstrapping problem, right? Like you, yeah. you, you, you kind of like need to trust some state or some node to even kind of like boot up your own node, right? Like and it's, you it's, need it's, permission it's a, to join. 
exactly right so you you um let's kind of like not get into like the deep side of like the difference between proof of stake or proof of work let's just say that i am um uh, i like the proof of work based consensus algorithms a lot more i think they're very elegant simple to reason about and more decentralized right and so we wanted to create something that is very similar to proof of work but because bitcoin has already done the proof of work uh, electricity consumption once we were intrigued by the idea that could you have a proof of work like system that reuses bitcoin's proof of work a little bit like how merge mining started right like merge mining is motivated by similar things that hey you have already calculated yeah. hash let's let's just try to reuse it so interestingly uh, our our idea is that people have already spent energy or electricity to produce bitcoin so bitcoin represents energy right it, it actually represents the work that was already done to mint it right so if you are effectively spending bitcoin or consuming bitcoin to secure a blockchain it's it is energy consumption uh, by proxy right because so it's it's a, it's a little bit like uh, can we design an algorithm where the input is not electricity but the input is actually bitcoin and then you have a random probability ah, of, become, see, yeah. of becoming a miner yes i see what you're saying right so it's it's very it's a very similar to proof of work it follows nakamoto style consensus as well uh, just like bitcoin the only difference is that instead of people spending electricity to have a probability of becoming a miner they're actually spending bitcoin so and then they have a probability of becoming a miner oh this is cool so so it's it's not merged mining but you already have bitcoin that you've had to to dispense with energy to get so and yes. and then here you have bitcoin so it's like if you look at bitcoin as like a a, a battery of energy value of a stored energy like the like almost like a bitcoin is like the future value of energy or something that it is like the value of time then you're using this to create a new sense of security but you can only get it so it remains permissionless in that way but at the same time there's the incentives are not kind of uh skewed or um the incentives don't get bastardized if that's the, the crude term to use how the consensus works is actually very similar to nakamoto style consensus right it, it uh that and and then you have this additional capability that because these miners are now running on bitcoin so it almost has like a cross chain consensus between the stacks layer and the bitcoin layer because these miners are aware of both the stacks layer and the bitcoin layer so they can actually perform certain operations on bitcoin based on the information that is on the stack side so it's almost like it links the miners are the link between stacks and and bitcoin. I love how I love how this all came together. I own a I actually own a an NFT on top of stacks called Satoshiables. I have oh, a Satoshiable. Amazing. Yeah, I had one of the early Satoshiable pro, uh Satoshiables. Mine is a is a Satoshi with uh you'll see it's a with a with a bitcoin and it's like it's really cool. I've posted it as my profile picture a few times. But I watched them kind of transfer over to stacks and I'm really excited about that. What other exciting projects are kind of in the pipe that you've seen uh are there any projects that you've kind of been 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 keeping your finger on yeah a bunch of them right so there uh, is one project uh called arcadico it's a stable coin uh so imagine we were having that discussion that hey can we actually deposit bitcoin into some sort of a reserve and mint a stable coin so Arc arcadico uh is is working on that oh, arcadico it, it, finance this is so cool yeah uh there is there's alex uh which is basically building a suite of uh, defi protocols so you can you can have like different types of defi products under the umbrella of of alex uh that's that's uh, really interesting uh on the nft side like i think you've seen the satoshibles but there are a bunch of other series if you go to uh, stxnft.com you'll see kind of like the top uh, listed nfts there and just the trading volume uh right now i think i saw some stat where the trading volume is already comparable to uh some of the top marketplaces on solana and other systems even though these are much more recent and and right now uh bitcoin trading isn't even fully live right like i think the bitcoin nft market is really going to in my view take off 
when you could actually just trade with with, with BTC, right? Like uh, because right now wow. that that uh, UX is still a little bit clunky, where people can just do a Bitcoin transaction and uh, and do trading for for these NFTs. You know what's going to end up happening? People are going to rewrap things on top of Bitcoin. They're going to see like wrap yeah. Ethereum on top of Bitcoin soon. Yeah, exactly. I think that that's a that's that's the thesis. If you remember, like this saying has been there in the Bitcoin ecosystem for a very long time. I think I first read it in a paper by Vences, where he, where he said that like out of the experiments that are happening on other blockchains, the successful experiments would eventually get created on top of Bitcoin, right? So if people are experimenting with 10 different types of stable coins, whichever design like in the end starts to take off, I think eventually it'll, it'll, it'll be built on top of Bitcoin. That's the thesis. And I think that's the work that we're trying to do. But I think on a day-to-day basis, I do think that we need to attract a lot more developers to the Bitcoin ecosystem. And, and I think we need better dev tooling. We need higher quality developers, more developers, and more education about, hey, look, all these things are possible on Bitcoin and, and, and you can just build it here. You know what happens like when someone joins crypto, wherever on the spectrum they join, obviously one of the first things you do is start becoming smart about it. You start learning the differences between what you're doing and how you're doing it, different types of consensus algorithms, and you learn the different types of of proofs and you learn the different types of blockchains and you learn all different types of bridges and wormholes and you you spend a lot of time really understanding the basic basic basics of things and you do at most if not everyone even the hardcore maximalists of ethereum or anything understand that 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 bitcoin is is the soundest money they have and usually when there's like issues with it it's always based on like the things you can do with it or the lack thereof. You and I understand that that's like a feature of not like one of the, the, the issues with it. So I do believe with developers is that my, I, you know, I've been an investor in, in dozens and dozens of blockchains, worked with them all. And I like experimenting and throwing things at the wall to see what sticks on projects that aren't finance that potentially using other blockchains. But over the last six months or so, well, that's a year or two or so, I've really come back to like, if it's going to be relating to people's money or my money, there needs to be a relationship with this and Bitcoin because I simply don't want to trust these new bootstrap blockchains anymore. I hate to say it, but it's true. Yeah, I, th- I think a lot of people actually come back to Bitcoin as well. If they go off and they experiment and then eventually realize there's a reason why the Bitcoin base layer is simple. And it is just doing one job and is doing that job really, really well. And I, th- I think like one thing that Bitcoiners, I feel like can also view this from a lens of like, look, if you're only interested in the base layer and sound money, you can just focus on the Bitcoin base layer. But we can have other experiments happen in different layers that are not impacting Bitcoin at all. Right? So if, pe- if developers are coming in and they're building applications using stacks, People who only care about Bitcoin as money can ignore it, right? But there are people who are really interested in seeing those new use cases as well, right? And, and it's much better to have, have those options available in the Bitcoin ecosystem and grow the Bitcoin economy than letting kind of like that type of applications and traffic go, go somewhere else. So we, we talked about, you know, we talked about having developers come on board, having a healthy ecosystem. As we get towards the end of this show, uh, where what's like a good jumping off point, a good resource for my listeners to kind of keep on top of stacks, to join the ecosystem? Not everyone is a developer too. What type of other things can people participate in? Uh, I think I think if you're if you're not technical, if you're not a developer, uh, I would say playing around with these Bitcoin NFTs is a is a great place to start because they're so much fun uh, and there's a sense of community in these NFTs. Uh, one thing I started noticing was that. There are different aspects of Bitcoin culture that started getting represented in these NFTs. Like there are concepts of like, you know, uh, like citadels. Someone came up with an NFT series about citadels. Uh, Bitcoin pizza is, is, a, is a cultural thing, right? And so people are making different NFTs about Bitcoin pizza. Or there's a, there's a series called uh, uh, Faces of Satoshi. So yeah. it's basically they're, they're saying that because we don't know who Satoshi uh, is or was, they're trying to have algorithms generate different potential faces of Satoshi. And then that's a very interesting art piece 
that, uh, that that's an NFT, right? So I think people can start playing around with these NFTs. And then, then interestingly, uh, you can even do uh, lightning swaps. You can, if you, if you, if you use lightning, you can actually do a lightning swap into these NFTs as well, which, which as a Bitcoiner is something pretty cool to do that, Hey, look, lightning now has these features where I can actually purchase NFTs to, through lightning directly. Right. So that, that would be another, another place where people can, can, can start in generally speaking, I would say stacks.co co is a website that then links to a bunch of different resources. It's a very decentralized ecosystem. So, uh, there are many different companies working in it. So from, from that website, you might discover like a bunch of other startups that are building on top or some other uh, companies that are building dev tools or applications and, and so on. Thank you for taking the time this Friday afternoon and coming on Untold Stories. And I'm excited that we're able to do a show and that hopefully we'll see each other in Miami in a few weeks. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to Miami. Same. Be safe, be healthy, have a great weekend. Thank you all the listeners for watching and listening today. If you leave me a review, I will read your name out. And if the review is nice, I'll read it on the air. Thank you to all my listeners who have kept me in the top 100 of podcasts this week, this week in all the countries, uh, all over the world. I really appreciate you. You give me purpose in life. Give me a job. Uh, you give me joy and happiness. And I'll talk to you all later. Be healthy, be happy, be safe. Thank you, my friend. I'll see you soon. Thank you so much.